Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, find your way to the seats, and we'll uh, go ahead and get started. Yeah. So today we're going to be finishing up Second uh, Peter chapter three. But uh, before we do, let's go ahead and go to uh, uh, the Lord and pray. Father, I do thank you for just who you are. I thank you for your love for us. I thank you that we have your word. And Father, I pray that you might just uh, uh, go before today, that uh, um, you might help me to relay your words. And Father, I just pray for you to be glorified in everything. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I guess we could uh, go ahead and just jump right to it. Um, Second Peter, if you want to turn in your Bibles to uh, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. I don't know if it's up there. It is. Peter starts off saying, This is now, beloved, the second letter that I'm writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder, that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Well, starting off, we can see the obvious, that this is second, uh, the second time Peter's written to the other believers. These believers were spread out over a large area. And we could see that in 1 Peter chapter 1, if uh, we have that slide, or if you want to turn into your Bibles to 1 Peter uh, 1, 1. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen. And I know we touched on this a, a little bit a couple of weeks ago, but I'm hoping to take it kind of just a little bit uh, of a step further. So if you could uh, pull up the first map. So in this first one, it's primarily a map of uh, Paul's missionary journeys, his first and second one. And he covered a lot of the southern areas of what's uh, called Turkey today. The areas Peter is writing to are all in the northern parts of Turkey. So some of the titles, I have a handy dandy cat toy here, um, Cappadocia, Galatia, Bithynia, uh, a lot of those were the places that he was writing to in the uh, first uh, uh, book of Peter. And then even in uh, later on in our text today, um, we're gonna see that uh, Paul even wrote to the churches. He wrote to some of them specifically, and also some of the areas uh, at the bottom where Paul had visited, there's a good chance that some of his letters also got uh, shared with uh, the neighbors to the north. Um, and just for your bearings, just, oh, that was on the other map, but um, yeah, if you want to go to the second map, that, that'd be great. So this is kind of a, more of a drawing, but this is what uh, modern Turkey looks like today. It's kind of a big area. Um, if uh, you look down towards the bottom, you can see Israel right there in the Mediterranean Sea. And still, a lot of the areas that Peter was writing to was all up in this northern area. Um, and you might be asking yourself right now, where are we going with this? And you know, really, that's kind of a fair question. In Second Peter, or in verse 2 of uh, Peter, He's saying one of the reasons he was writing to them is that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. And over the last couple of weeks, we've already seen how Peter was saying that it's important to have this vibrant, growing relationship with the Lord. 
and that they or we might grow in our knowledge of Jesus Christ, to trust in the accuracy and the authenticity of the scriptures, to be students of God's word and to know God's word. And all of that was because, in part, false prophets and false teachers were going to be coming, and they want to lead them astray out of their delusions, their greed, selfish, or fleshly motives. And that it's in this relationship with the Lord and knowing his word that it's going to keep them from being led astray. And we had covered this in several uh, areas before. And then I started thinking about the different places in this country that Paul visited and stayed and wrote to while on his missionary journeys. And there were a fair amount of places, too. Some of the areas we know that he had visited at least three times. Several books in the New Testament were written to these areas on the lower half of the country, Ephesians, Colossians, and then there's Galatians and up in the other uh, uh, half of the country that Peter mentions. And also, from what we read about Paul, I'm certain that as he was going to these various cities that he had written to, he's probably sharing the gospel to everybody who he could grab hold of while uh, on his way. Yeah. (laughs) And I wonder, you know, kind of how these people, these churches fared from all the false prophets, probably persecution. And then I started kind of feeling a little bit sad. I mean, really, how many of us, when we think of Turkey, that Christianity comes to mind? I know with me, though. You know, and and that's kind of what I was, you know, kind of pondering. It's like, oh my gosh, what went wrong? I mean, did they not adhere to God's word? Weren't they not steadfast? I mean, anyway. I started digging into it a a little bit deeper. On Wikipedia's site, it says that Islam is the largest religion in Turkey, according to the state anyway, with a 99.8% of the population being initially registered by the state as a Muslim. Over 99%. Well, as it's digging into this more and more, came across some other information. And, you know, really I found myself uh, quite encouraged by it. If you could go to the other slide with the chart. Oh, it does come in clear. Okay. It it was kind of blurry. I wasn't sure how it would come through. Sorry, got excited. (laughs) Okay, so I don't know any of the uh, doctrinal statements of these churches. Some of them are Catholic. Some are, uh, you know, I don't know what you'd call them. I want to say mainstream, but you know, with titles like uh, uh, Protestantism in Turkey, you know, I don't know. But they're listed as uh, uh, Christianity in a Muslim area, and I was really encouraged. I mean, you could see up in this area here, I mean, 65,000, you know, the Patriarch of Constantinople, uh, 18,000, 20,000. There are a remnant of Christians still there in this 99% Muslim state. I mean, talk about something that might be scarier or, you know, it's, it's almost like, you know, being toe-to-toe with the enemy just about. I mean, they are two opposing beliefs. Anyway, so I was really encouraged by this, um, that there are still some there. This letter from Peter was written to these people, or at least this people's group several thousand years ago. 
And I would venture to say that one of the reasons there are still brothers in the Lord over there is become, because from one generation to another, they took what Peter and Paul said to heart. They were growing in the relationship with the Lord, putting their trust in God's word. And I think these people's survival is the outcome of applying diligence to our growth and our relationship with the Lord. These qualities that Peter spoke of in the first chapter, he said, for these qualities, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, this isn't a big percentage. But then I think the percentage of, in all fairness anyway, the percentage of true believers in our country it's probably getting smaller. I mean, compared to the whole population. Yeah, there's you know, others coming to know Christ. But I, I think percentage-wise, that's just my take. Um, you know, but anyway, it, it was still encouraging to see that there is still some, some there. Anyway, I wanted to touch on this about Turkey, just in hopes it would give us insight about the book but also bringing it kind of closer to home with where they are in modern times. Back to our text, though. In chapter 3 of verse 2, we can see Peter again reminding them to remember what the prophets wrote. Not only that, but also the commandment of the Lord, where he says that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior by your apostles. The prophets spoke on many different things. Some of it was the coming of our Savior. Some was on the day of judgment. Jesus spoke and taught on many different things. Some was on the second coming. And some was, yes, on the judgment of God or the day of judgment. And I think this is what Peter is inferring to in verse 2, since he's about to touch on the subject of the day of the Lord. And we see that transition in the next passage. I'm going to go to verse 3 through 7. He says, Know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues, just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water, and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. I think Peter's first point is, mockers will come. And if that wasn't bad enough, they're going to be surrounded by, or at least had been infiltrated by false prophets that we saw last week. And now mockers on top of it. You know, it's really kind of interesting. If you look at verse 4, he's saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. And they, So they, they acknowledge that there was creation or the beginning of it. But they're questioning the promise of Christ's coming. And these promises are found in Scripture. They are questioning God's word when they're bringing this in. Peter says that they even recognize or have a consciousness of the beginning of creation that we saw just at the end of verse 4. But they are living as if there are no consequences, like nothing matters, nothing changes, just going through life, doing whatever we want, as we read in verse 3, following after their own lusts. 
But regarding God's word, his power, his authority, Peter says in verse 5 and 6, for they maintain this, as far as that stand, and it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water, and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed by flooding of water. And I think the first part of verse 5 says, for when they maintain this, it's actually more accurate in other translations. Yours might say something like, uh, they are willingly ignorant. They willfully ignore or deliberately overlook. And this is a conscious, deliberate choice. Wanting so much to be right about this that they overlook the fact that it was by God's word that the heavens existed long ago. And it was by God's word that the earth was formed out of water. And it was by God's word that the world was destroyed by water. And it's by God's word that the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. So everything that they're alluding to, they're willingly ignoring it. As we see in verse 7, during the time of the flood, or rather shortly before, this was a time when all mankind ignored and turned from God and pursued their lust. There's no morality except with one man and his family. Scripture doesn't say specifically that Noah was mocked, but think about it. This was during the pinnacle of mankind's depravity and rejection of God. And there was this guy out there building this huge boat in the middle of dry ground. I would imagine he was probably mocked. I mean, just all things considered. If that didn't seem crazy enough, he was most likely telling them to repent or forewarning them about this great destruction about to come, this flood. I mean, after all, we know that in uh, chapter 2, verse 5, Noah was called a preacher of righteousness, so I'm sure he was proclaiming the truth to them. And some might ask, how did it get so bad? Couldn't God step in sooner? Well, yes, and really he did. There are generations of men before Noah that obeyed God and looked to him and walked with him. Enoch walked with God. He never even experienced death because God took him straight to glory with him. So yes, there were godly men all around. They just didn't want to listen. They preferred their own lusts over a relationship with God. So it's not like things got so bad God had to step in and do something about it. Nor... Is he just waiting for things to get bad enough that he brings down his judgment, as mentioned in verse 7? God has a plan and a purpose. Even though mockers are saying nothing has, will, or is going to happen, it will. Look what Peter says in verses 8 and 9. He says, but do not let this one fact escape your notice. That with the Lord, a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years, one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. I mean, that just shows the love of God right there. The Lord is being patient because he doesn't want anybody to perish, but all come to repentance. I'm sure you are, as well as me, but I'm thankful the Lord's patient. And he waited till I came to repentance. And we should be thankful, really, that he's doing the same for others. And Peter even touches on that in, in just a little bit.
So to me, it sounds like God is waiting for all to come to repentance, clear up to the very last person that will or does repent. And I've often thought about this, you know, imagining the very last person who puts their trust in Christ. Does God start the day of judgment, like, boom, right then? You know, or does he wait until that person has a chance to mature some, or what? I don't know. It's going to be interesting to find out. But that is what he's waiting for, is for all to come to repentance. And eventually, there's going to be a last one. Starting in verse uh, 10, Peter starts to describe a little bit about what's going to happen when that day comes. He says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and all its works will be burned up. There's nothing stopping our God. He is the almighty God. Just like by his word, he spoke the world into existence. By his, his word, it will be consumed. Talk about being in a state of awe. The writer of Hebrews is speaking of the person that rejects Christ. And he says in uh, chapter 1031, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. That's what many are going to experience. But none of this should be anything that scares us. Since all of these things are going to be destroyed, starting in verse 11, sorry. What sort of people ought you be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. The fact is, we should be looking forward to this or longing for it even. We should be a people that is about our Father's business, as it says in verse 11, and looking towards this time with eager anticipation to urge on as praying for this day that we see in verse 12. In verse 13, we see the other half of this great event as well. It says, but according to his promise, we are looking for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. I think the point Peter is trying to get across is to the same degree of absolute fact that God is going to destroy heaven and earth. He has promised and he will create a new heaven and earth and all righteousness is going to live there. it would be okay. We're not going to be hanging out in limbo somewhere. We could trust God and his promise. In the beginning of verse 14, Peter says, therefore, meaning because of all of this, everything that we've already read, because of all of this, with the great day of the Lord coming, when the heavens pass away, all the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and all the earth and its works will be burned up, and God promises a new heaven and a new earth. Because of all of this, that's what he means by therefore, so because of all of this, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found in him. This is in verse 14. Spotless and blameless. And regard the patient of the Lord as salvation, just as our brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you. And as also with all of his letters, speaking in him, them these things in which some of these things are hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scripture to their own destruction. I think Peter is bringing his letter kind of back to full circle, if you will, challenging them and reminding them, be diligent so when the Lord comes, 
He'll find you being about his business. Be at peace. Don't be getting into fights with false prophets and mockers. That's just kind of my take on it. But be spotless and blameless. Don't be carried away by any of the false teachings and their lusts. And when it seems like the Lord is taking a long time to come, think of it as someone else going to repent or being saved. He's also pointing them back to Scripture with the letters that Paul wrote and that there will be those who distort God's word. There are going to be some tricky days ahead to navigate through. And even right now, in our current day, there are challenges. But I think it's going to get more challenging as the day of the Lord draws nearer. Brothers and sisters, we we need to be on guard We have been forewarned, as scripture says. We need to continually be growing in our relationship with the Lord. Growing in the knowledge of our God. And all for the purpose so that we don't be led astray ourselves. In verse 17, it says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this firsthand, or beforehand, excuse me, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall away from your own steadfastness. Verse 18, it says, But grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. You know, over the last couple of weeks, we've seen God's sovereignty throughout this entire book. In chapter 1, verses 3 and 10, we saw his uh, sovereignty in our salvation. He said he called us. He chose us. And in chapter 2, verses 3, 12, and 13, he was sovereign over false prophets. They're not going to get away with it, with their false teachings, their misleadings. And here today, just in in chapter 3, verses 7 through 10, multiple examples that he is sovereign over the last days. It will happen in his timing. Nothing will be able to withstand it. There's truly no God like our God. As what is a repeated theme in this book, Peter sums up in the first half of verse 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to be continually growing if we're going to thrive. It's truly what's best for us. Anyway. Go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you for who you are again. I thank you for this relationship you brought us into. I pray, Father, that you might help us to grow. Don't ever let us get stagnant. Help us to just continually look into you more and more. Help our trust in you to grow. Help our love for you to grow. Father, you are ultimately what's best for us. Father, lead us in your way, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I think we have uh, another song or two to sing.